Do you know why? There's nothing more contagious than laughter. My line. There's nothing more contagious than laughter. These videos are not for children. If you are a children, then piss off. Hey there, I'm V Infuso. And in the past on this channel, I briefly spoke about Cameron Monaghan's portrayal of the Joker. He was without a doubt the best Joker we've ever had. Mm -hmm. Because he was everything. He brought that same energy and intensity to like this role that Mark Hamill does when he gets on the microphone. This kid understood the character probably better than anybody who's ever performed it before. And today, I'm here to expand upon that. Now, this video is being made right before I rewatch the entire Gotham series for other videos on this channel. This way, I can cover it in vivid detail. So, this video is being made up entirely from my own memory of watching the show the first time around. And also, what I may or may not have researched online. I say this now because there's a decent chance that eventually this topic will be brought up again on this channel. So, there you go. When Gotham first came out, all the promotions and trailers showcased some of the top villains in Batman's rogues gallery. You had the Pang one, the Riddler, and they even teased the possibility of Two-Face. Some of the biggest names in all of Batman lore. Though there was one that was suspiciously missing. Arguably Batman's greatest foe, and potentially could be seen as his driving factor, the clown prince of crime himself, the Joker. None of the ads showed the Joker. At first, the character was left under a veil of mystery, but we were told that he existed in this canon to some degree. Now, initially, the showrunners publicly stated that the Joker would be heavily referenced throughout the show. As opposed to them just presenting the Joker, they were giving the power to the show's audience and allowing them to choose who they felt exemplified the Joker the best. It was basically the choose-your-own-adventure of Batman lore. You see, there wouldn't just be one direct Joker. Instead, there would be a bunch of minor characters created that could potentially become the Joker. And it was up to everybody watching to ultimately decide who the real deal was. And I actually really enjoyed that concept. It was an interesting and different way of portraying the Joker. And I think knowing the Joker character, it was a smart decision creatively as well. Because this Gotham was an origin story. We were learning about the younger lives of all of our characters. And the Joker, as... Anybody who's ever read a comic or, or seen The Dark Knight at some point in life will tell you that the Joker is more a concept than he is a character. I'm an idea. State of mind. Unlike the vast majority of Batman villains who all have these redeemable humanizing qualities, the Joker has none. And any time that we're shown a human side to the character, it's pretty much retconned that he might just be full of shit. The guy's a sociopath. He could read anybody like a book, and he plays upon people's vulnerabilities and weaknesses. Case in point, Harley Quinn. To say that the Joker's an unreliable narrator is kind of an understatement. So the fact that they would reference this character and not give him an established backstory was awesome for me. It made me feel like the people who were running this show really understood the character. However, as you're about to learn, it wasn't creative integrity that stopped them from using the Joker. To their credit, the show did go with their initial idea. On multiple occasions in the show's first season, there was a potential Joker. The first episode of the show had a nervous comedian, who could very easily be the Joker plucked from the Killing Joke story. There was a very familiar sinister laugh played in the background during scenes at Arkham. So, you know, there were Easter eggs. They, they, they were true about that. I mean, granted, they did initially say that there would be a Joker in every episode, and, and that wasn't the case. It was more like every couple episodes, there was, there was a possibility of one. But, you know, I was satisfied nonetheless. Why not just include the Joker? I mean, yeah, creatively, I guess this kind of works out, but you mean to tell me that they're not going to use the biggest villain in all of Batman history? He even has his own movie. It's a license to print money. You mean to tell me? That they're not going to use the Joker officially? He's the most famous criminal in all of Gotham City. He's a big name. He'd probably put some butts in seats. And honestly, how, how does anybody even make a Batman product without the Joker? Comic book writers sure as hell don't know how to do that. So why not use him? Well, the answer isn't all that complicated. Simply put, they couldn't. They straight up couldn't. 
You see, the show did have Warner Brothers owned characters in it, but it was a series that was made by Fox, meaning that Fox didn't have access to the entire DC universe. Basically, an agreement was made that there were certain characters the show just couldn't use. And at the tip top of that list was, you guessed it, the Joker. So this whole choose your own Joker was a cop out to appease Batman fans and to still abide by Warner Brothers rules and regulations. Pretty sneaky, sis. Cameron Monaghan of Shameless fame was contracted to guest star on an episode of the show. He's basically signed on to be another throwaway you know who. Just some nobody who one day may be a somebody. Except the thing was, he was good. Like, like, like really good. Maybe even a little bit too good. <laughs> Looks like the bitch got me with a zinger in the end. Been banging a clown the next one. You know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're gonna need a lot more of this! <laughs> Fans of the show immediately flocked his portrayal of the character. You were quite the showman. Thank you. Always nice to be appreciated. And he was very quickly proclaimed the real deal in a sea of imposters. I'm also sure it didn't help matters that the marketing for this episode spoiled the reveal and heavily implied that he was the series' official version of this character. But even if nobody saw those, any Batman fan could tell you that this was a clown without his face paint. Jerome Valesco was very much the Urkel of Gotham. God, I, I, I can't escape that kid. I just say all the time. He just always comes up. It's nothing to do. He just keeps coming up. His mere presence revitalized the series and it brought a whole lot of new eyes to the product. This isn't an exaggeration. Those who weren't paying attention to Gotham pre-Jerome were heavily invested post-Jerome. Huh, <laughs> post-Jerome. Why does my mind work like this? And those who were already paying attention to Gotham became obsessed. This was a big deal. You know, I'll even go out of my way to say that there were a lot of people who were genuinely beginning to enjoy Jerome more than they were the rest of the show. Which really has to be seen as a compliment because the show was fine without him. So, slowly but surely, the show began to embrace that. After coming out of the crazy closet in his debut episode, you know, what with admitting to murdering his nagging mother, the madness was only then further amplified in his follow-up appearances. The performance Cameron gave really blew me away. And it is in my personal opinion that he is perfect in this role. That is not to jest the wonderful clowns who have come before him. I mean, I love Heath Ledger and Joaquin Phoenix as the character. But both of those seem to be a reinterpretation of the original character. A and they're great. I, I really do enjoy new takes on old characters. And those two had phenomenal performances. But Cameron here, Cameron is just straight up playing the Joker. And, and look, I, I know this might be one of my controversial takes here, but I, I'll say it. He's up there with Mark Hamill for me. Just, just his tone, the inflection in his voice, his mannerisms, the way that he goes about everything. Everything about this performance is everything I ever wanted to see in a Joker performance. I mean, seriously, his laugh, his movements, everything about this is the Joker. And yet, legally, he couldn't be. The character could never actually become the Joker, despite very blatantly already being the Joker. Sure, he didn't use the Joker name, and yet he didn't have green hair or bleached white skin. But come on now, that, that's the guy. That's our man right there. I, I can identify him out of any lineup. That's the man, officer. 
and the inevitable only became more and more obvious with the passing of time. Season by season, they were just furthering the perception. Jerome's wardrobe reflected the Joker's various wardrobe changes. His face was cut off, as was the Joker's in some comics that I choose not to acknowledge. He started using Joker gas. He was given his trademark grin. Guy began recreating famous Joker poses. Hell, he even began quoting the Joker. We all could go insane with just one bad day. Not to mention, he was just freely giving his card out like who the hell he was. Even though the show wants to claim that he isn't, this man was the Joker in everything but name. How they somehow managed to dodge enough lawsuits to be able to complete the show is beyond me. The brand flat out told you no. And you thought, well, I don't know. I, I feel like there's a little bit of a gray area there. Can't you do something? Afraid not. I am with Mr. Valeska 100%. The show managed to cover their own ass. By insisting that Jerome wasn't actually the series version of the character, he was its predecessor. The precursor to the actual Joker. They even killed him off for a time being, and began a cult in his name. Which I have some mixed feelings about. See, I like the concept of the Joker having followers of sorts. It fits the narrative of Joker being a concept rather than the character. I'm an idea. He is a madness that creates more madness in its wake. Joker is an absolutely awful, irredeemable character, but he is strangely charismatic and his presence is otherworldly. So I can absolutely buy into other people following in his footsteps. Batman Beyond comes to mind, where years after the Joker's disappearance, there's still an entire gang called Jokers causing chaos in his name. However, I don't really buy this concept when it's altered like this. Insisting that the Joker, the actual Joker, is actually some nutjob trying to recreate someone else's crimes, it really diminishes the character. Joker isn't the character to take the torch. He's the one who lights it and then burns down your living room. He's not some no-name copycat. There's a reason he's so reviled and infamous. It's because Gotham City has never seen a force like him before. And that's saying something, because Gotham City is a city filled with icemen, furries, Scalies, a dude who commits crimes and then tells you how he did it. I, I don't I don't know. <laughs> Even given that climate, Joker still stands out amongst the rest. Having the Joker as a follower goes against everything the character stands for, and it lessens his importance and the overall impact he has on Harley Quinn, and on Batman, and on Gotham. But to the show's credit, I think they did realize this at some point in time. And if it wasn't that, and if they didn't realize their own creative faults when reworking the origin of the character, then they just understood that Gotham fans wouldn't settle for anything less but Cameron Monaghan in the role. Even if he's not technically the Joker, his performance is still the closest we've ever come to the character in live action form. So he was brought back, and he continued to be presented as the show's answer to the character. All while the show executives continued to deny he was the clown in question. Cameron really hit it out of the park with his guest appearances on the show, and it seemed all but inevitable that one day, e even if we don't get to see it because, you know, agreements won't let us, it seemed inevitable that he was Joker-bound. If only that was the fucking case. You're Splatterbrowski! <laughs> no, you won't. If you wanted him dead, you would've killed him already. <laughs> He's right. I'll see you soon. <laughs> Just when you thought it was safe to log back into YouTube. Hello, Gotham. Joker's back in town. And you know, they say that a man can go mad with just one bad day. Well, I'm coming back from two bad months, so just imagine where I am. No, 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 please hold your applause. I'm happy to be back. I, I know plenty of you are because you certainly let me know that you were pissed off that I was gone, which is both very flattering and also irritating. It's been a rough few weeks. Now, I previously spoke on this channel about how I felt about Cameron Monaghan's time on Gotham. I don't want to spoil anything here for you, but the name of that video was Gotham Had the Best Joker. So, figure out what side of the fence I'm on just from, from that. And that's because I truly felt that the performance that Cameron put in is without a shadow of a doubt the most authentic live-action Joker ever to live-action. Very poor choice of words. <laughs> but I think a couple of you may have gotten it confused. 
because I've read through the comments and everyone's claiming that I'm putting Cameron over Hamill and that's complete blasphemy, but I I'm not. I'm specifically talking about live action here. Mark Hamill is the Joker. There there there's, there's no disputing that. And if you try to, well then, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to say somebody's opinion is wrong, but, but yours is wrong and I don't like you as a person. And we will never be friends. And while Mark Hamill perfectly personifies the Joker and brings to life what I believe is one of the most sinister and iconic performances in all of movie and TV villainy, I truly feel that Cameron brought that same kind of spirit and energy to the physical end of the role. I think he brings that same kind of passion and intensity when he's on screen. You know, that is until he didn't. But but hold on, we're gonna get there, okay? Just 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 bear with me here. And also, I keep getting comments, how could I dare put Cameron's performance over Heath Ledger and, and Joaquin Phoenix. And again, I explained that in the last video, but for the cheap seats, I'm, I'm gonna do it again. Also, I, I think probably a lot of you just read the title and then, and then, then dipped. You, you, just, you just got the fuck out of there. Heath Ledger and Joaquin Phoenix both put on some of the most unique and incredible performances anybody in uh, cinematic history in face paint has ever put on. There's no taking anything away from them. Their individual performances were brilliant, and they really left a lasting impression on movie history and pop culture as a whole. These are roles that will be remembered in the comic book movie genre for generations to come. As a matter of fact, I would say both of their careers are probably largely going to be defined, maybe not exclusively for those roles, but largely those roles. They are fantastic performances. But again, I felt that each of them are reinterpretations of what the Joker was. Whereas Cameron, when he was on screen, kind of just portrayed the character from the comic books. And I also got a lot of comments from uh, avid comic book fans telling me I don't know what I'm talking about because there's no way that, that Cameron could portray the Joker perfectly when, when, when this is a made up backstory. This is nothing like the Joker from the comics. And again, guys, I was talking specifically and solely about his performance. I didn't say that the background of the character is just like the comics, that that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the performance itself, the performance, what he brought to screen, that is what we are talking about, just so we're clear. I also read a lot of people saying that Cameron is simply duplicating Heath Ledger's time in the role, and no. I mean, yeah, I guess they have similar sounding voices, I'll give you that. But all you've done is mope for the last Six weeks. Why so serious? Hiya, Pops. Long time. No see. <laughs> I thought my jokes were bad. But his inflections are much closer to resembling Mark Hamill's, and his physical mannerisms seem to reflect Jack Nicholson. To me, discrediting him because he sounds like Heath Ledger is like discrediting Christian Slater in any movie he's ever been in because he sounds like Jack Nicholson. Chaos is great. Chaos is what killed the dinosaurs, darling. Fine. Why don't you start right now and get the fuck out of here? I'm a little tired of people accusing me of doing Jack Nicholson. It's not the same performance. It's just not. And honestly, that's why I like Cameron so much. I think that he takes the right elements from several different, well-established Joker performances and combines them together for a really effective take on the Joker lore. And to everyone in my comment section telling me that he was one of the worst Jokers and he was the cringiest of all time, well, it seems like your favorite Joker disagrees with you. So shut up. Okay, so now, with that out of the way, let's pick things back up. While I appreciate the show Gotham very, very much, I will admit that it doesn't come without its faults. One really strange tired TV trope it seems to keep on going with is the evil twin. You know the one. The one where we find out that there's an alternate version of a character that we already know and love, or in some cases hate. And yeah, I mean there's plenty of storylines already established within the DC Universe that kind of play on that. You know you have your standard uh, uh, hushes, you got your bizarros, but Gotham, instead of deciding to choose from that well, decide to pour from its own creative faucet. It's discovered that Bruce Wayne has his own clone. And no, it's not Thomas Elliot. Riddler has a love interest who gets killed off. But it's alright, because, you know, she's got a lookalike somewhere. It's, it's, it's gonna be okay. Same actress and everything. It's fine. And Jerome? 
literally had a previously undiscussed identical twin brother named Jeremiah. No joke. Unlike Jerome, Jeremiah was depicted as being sane. You're insane. Yeah. And putting his intellect to good use. Allegedly, Jeremiah was removed from Jerome's life at the request of his mother, who believed that Jerome wanted to shatter his mirror image. And considering we're talking about the kid who would go on to kill his own mother, yeah, I'd say that's a pretty believable claim. Yeah, it seems like there's a little validity there. Except, according to Jerome, it was Jeremiah who made all those stories up about him, causing their family to become abusive toward him in Jeremiah's absence. Long story short, after a brief family reunion and some torture, you know how those things go. Jerome takes his final leave from the series, but not before leaving his brother with a parting gift, dosing him with a severe supply of Joker Venom. Oh, uh, well, well, I mean, legally, they're not allowed to call it that, but yeah, that, that is what it is. As you can imagine, this has some internal as well as external effects. On top of that, I must ask, what's up with this new makeover? Uh, what are you doing? Are you cosplaying as Data from Star Trek? That's a bad choice. He's one of the worst jokers out there. Always wanted to carve this bird. <laughs> another day? Another day! There won't be another day! Not for any of us! <laughs> Look, I'm sorry, Brent. I really enjoy y your body of work, but please keep your body away from Batman. The way their stories are set up, it still never really delivers an answer to the show's audience. Who's the real victim and who's the real victimizer? Who drove the other mad? Who made who? It's a question that really only continues to show its layers as time goes on. It's like an onion. That's right. I've seen Shrek once. It's a real uh, chicken or the egg scenario. From a storytelling standpoint, I'd say this still fits the Joker's aesthetic. Because even when we're told his backstory, it's still somehow shrouded in mystery and multiple choice. However, what I enjoy significantly less is Cameron's time as Jerome's last minute replacement. And yes, before everybody wants to come at me in the comments, I'm very well aware it's the same actor. However, what it's not is the same performance. Jeremiah is not just a tired rehash of Jerome. Actually, if he was, I might like him a little bit better. While yes, he does effectively take over his legacy, he goes about it in his own way. There have been many, many different portrayals of the Joker, and the show borrowed heavily from several. Whether it was his attire, his aesthetic, or, or plot points... But in terms of overall character, Jerome was Gotham's version of the insane Joker, the anarchist. Jeremiah, on the other hand, was Gotham's version of the super sane Joker, the one who led a life of organized crime. Jeremiah spoke in a constantly calm, mortifyingly monotone way that could unsettle a monk years deep in meditation. He acted very matter-of-factly, and he always seemed control in any given situation he was in, even if he wasn't. The character didn't have the personality or the pizzazz that his infamous brother did. Let me just say that this version of the character isn't entirely without its charm. Yes, he clearly couldn't fill his brother's clown shoes, but Cameron is great as always. This secondary interpretation, while not necessarily ideal for me, was at least truthful to a separate source material for the character. Jeremiah's look was a lot more similar to the more traditional Joker look, so fans of the natural pale skin and colorful outfits could rejoice. However, I really really have a hard time getting behind a character that's called the Joker and having it portrayed as a humorless psychopath. It's just, I, maybe they were trying to go for irony? Hashtag, not my Joker, come at me. Jeremiah was shown to have a proxy who devoted her entire life to him, a woman who went by the name of Echo. So of course it's only natural that she basically become the series equivalent to Harley Quinn. But, you know, legally distinct. She was hopelessly, relentlessly devoted to a maniac who always had his own best interest at heart. That is, if, if he even had a heart. The scenes Echo and Jeremiah share are fantastic. And I think that they're the real silver lining of the last minute twin magic the show decided to pull off. Undoubtedly, the highlight of Jeremiah's time as the Clown Prince of Crime was the dynamic between these two. You have to remember, viewers went into this show thinking that they would never see a Joker. So who could have guessed that we not only would have gotten two of them, but also a Harley Quinn thrown in for good measure. There wasn't a whole lot of time devoted to their background, but there was enough time to understand their relationship and appreciate what the show created. Another thing the series did was give both Jerome and Jeremiah a connection to Bruce Wayne. Both brothers interacted, took an interest in, and even had an obsession with the young billionaire. Jeremiah even on occasion referred to Bruce as his very best friend. And yes, 
That is a very Joker mentality. Those not in depth with the lore may just think that Joker is Batman's arch enemy. He's the maniacal clown who constantly is trying to kill our dear Dark Knight. But that's actually not the case. The Joker doesn't want to kill Batman. He wants to break him. In his sick mind, the two of them are opposing pieces of the same puzzle. And the Joker is really just desperate in trying to get him to see things his way. And if you think I'm blowing smoke, then here, take the performance that you guys are all fucking beating me over the head with in the comments section. Then why do you want to kill me? <laughs> I don't, don't want to kill you. What would I do without you? You complete me. Oh look, he almost said that exact thing. Let him die a little sooner than the rest of the city. Wait, we've been having fun stabbing him. Hitting him, emotionally torturing him. I don't want it to end. <laughs> Choose one to live and one to die. Free the bats! Drop the broad! Of course, in the comics, it is in fact Batman and Joker, and not Bruce Wayne and Jeremiah Valeska. But seeing as these are this series' counterparts for those characters, works pretty well. The dynamic is definitely there. And there's a good enough chemistry between these two actors that you buy into it. I think what I really enjoy the most is that despite Jeremiah's twisted ways, Bruce still seems hell-bent on trying to help him. And that... That's Batman. Batman doesn't kill his enemies. He tries to rehabilitate them. Even if by society standards, there, there is no help for them. And maybe he's a little bit misguided in what he's doing, but you always know that Bruce has the best interest and good intentions at heart. It's almost like these two are constantly fighting trying to convert the other into their own way of thinking. This is the most physical spirited debate that I've ever seen in all of my years. Jeremiah acted significantly different from Jerome, but even in saying that he wasn't a complete contrast to the Joker character. While I don't think he was spot on as Jeremiah, he did aesthetically resemble the character a lot more. His mentality and level of unnatural calmness in any and all given situations certainly highlighted some of the character's more sinister ways. Jeremiah always seemed to have a trick up his sleeve. He had contingency plans A through Z. While Jerome operated purely off anarchy and destruction. Personally, I felt this version of the character hit a little too close to characters like Hannibal Lecter and Antoine Chigurh. Probably not saying that right. I, I, I don't think I ever have. But then again, I'm, I'm probably not saying Cameron Monaghan's name right. So, I, so why, why are you subscribed to me? I do enjoy Cameron's time as Jeremiah. But I don't think he could really hold a candle to his previous incarnation of the character. Cameron did well what he was given. The problems with Jeremiah don't stem from the actor portraying him, but instead the show that created the role. When I personally think of the Joker, I think of a larger-than-life personality that doesn't ask for, but demands, the attention of all those in attendance. Simply by being in attendance. That, to me, is the Joker. And that, to me, is Jerome Valeska. I don't think Jeremiah was as brain-dead of an idea as others do, but I do at least have to question it a bit. The fact that viewers of the series sat by for four years eagerly awaiting Jerome's ultimate transformation, only to be given a brand new guy with his face feels really, really cheap. I just don't see the Joker as some humorless psychopath who rarely cracks a smile. I just don't know if Jeremiah had the... I don't know if he had the... I don't know if he had... Flair? Huh? Style? Class? Huh? Go on, boy, spit it out, I can take it. And apparently I'm not alone in this thought process either. Because I went to the Vigenerates, and I decided to ask them this very question. And Jerome won by a landslide, no competition. <sighs> Jerome beat me, and that'll be the day. <laughs> Jerome yet again carrying this whole franchise on its back. And while I can't sit here and say I dislike Cameron's portrayal, it does, again pale in comparison to the show's previously established potential Joker. So why do it? I, why do it? Riddle me that. I wouldn't say Jeremiah was a black mark on the series, but he definitely was a very big question mark. So now ultimately, do I think Gotham had the worst Joker? That being Jeremiah Valeska? No, absolutely not. I will say he definitely was one of the more disappointing ones, but at the end of the day, Cameron was great in both roles. But I kind of feel like replacing Jerome with Jeremiah was kind of like... It, it was kind of like striking gold and then throwing that gold out because you found a really cool rock. Like, alright, it's nice, I guess, but, but, but how about that gold, though? You know, it's funny. When I first started working on this video, it was with the intention of making it one video. 
This is one big video detailing the history of the character on the show, as well as my thoughts on it, and maybe I'll throw in a joke here and there. But the more I wrote, the more I realized I had a whole lot to say about it. So now that we covered Jerome in part one, we've covered Jeremiah in part two, we're on to the final episode in this miniseries where we cover the Joker in Gotham. What do you want, Jeremiah? Sir Jeremiah here. So what do I call you? I don't know. Call me... Let's pick back up where we left off. One of the many, many, many... Many, 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 many complaints I get on those videos is that I'm clearly wrong. Because Gotham didn't really have the Joker. They didn't have the rights to use that character. Which is why Cameron Monaghan never had green hair and never went by the Joker name. You're not very wrong. And you're half right. Half. While the show did at first not have the rights to the character, and basically had to jump through hoops and be put through the ringer to convince Warner Brothers that they weren't using the character that they were explicitly told not to use, all while also trying to reassure fans of the series that he was in fact the character that they said he wasn't. Naughty, naughty. Of course, that wasn't the plan when casting Cameron the first time around, but his performance demanded attention. I want to be the star of the show! When all was said and done, they did manage to secure the rights to the character for the show's final season. Sort of. Somewhat. Kinda. A deal was made that basically said, Uh, yeah, sure, I guess you can make him the Joker, since you basically already made him the Joker anyway. But, you know, just don't call him the Joker. Cause, cause that, that'll make everybody happy. That'll put a smile on everybody's face. I'm sure nobody's gonna be upset with that turn of events. So to everyone trying to convince me that neither Jerome nor Jeremiah was the Joker, and that they were just some sort of unrelated prelude to that character, need I remind you that Jeremiah literally went through the most famous and accepted Joker origin? The dude fell into a vat of chemicals! I mean, I think it's pretty clear that he was meant to be Gotham's Joker! Plus, Cameron pretty much outright confirmed it, stating that the show is now given certain liberties with this character. So yes, guys, this is Gotham's Joker. Whether you like it, whether you don't, that's what it is. Now in my last video, I was a bit critical of the show's secondary incarnation of the Clown Prince of Crime. And I still stand by all of that. But to be fair, the show did at least up the ante in its final season. Jeremiah did see a further evolution that I will admit comes a lot closer to the Joker of comic book lore than he had been in the previous season. Not as close as Jerome, of course, but still definitely an improvement. The character would also see a secondary transformation, officially becoming the series' non-official Joker. This is not confusing to talk about at all, and I'm sure everybody in the comments section is going to come to one conclusive opinion of this whole ordeal. Now, it's been stated before that the Jeremiah variation of the character took a lot of inspiration from the Dark Knight Returns Joker. So be that the case, it's perfectly fitting that following his accident and Bruce's exit from Gotham City, that just like that version of the Joker, Jeremiah falls into a catatonic state. Or so it seems. Now I know that this version of the character, uh, much like his previous incarnations, is very divisive. But personally, I actually really dig it. The chemicals have burned and discolored his face, making him look much more sinister. Whatever humanity could be seen on him before is now completely removed. And that perfectly reflects the character itself. This really helps highlight that this is no longer the character or characters that we once knew. The physical state of Jeremiah now reflects the mental and emotional states of the character. But I will say, and I may sound a little bit hypocritical here considering that I am a bald bearded bastard myself, but I guess I could have gone without the bald joker. Though there were at least some strands of green hair up there, just so the audience could be let in on the fact that this is in fact the joker. Though apparently my comment section didn't get that memo. In all seriousness, a big part of me genuinely likes the look of this character. And in terms of acting, I enjoy this performance a lot, because it to me feels like the perfect amalgamation of both Jerome and Jeremiah. A uh, uh, Jerome Amaya, if you will. There was another me too. Oh, it's so hard holding onto us Rios. <clears throat> it's enough to drive you mad. I really appreciate this version of the Joker. And the fact that he still only hinted at his name, and he only just started to don the clown like appearance. I think it's more than safe to say Gotham. You ain't seen nothing yet! <laughs> so say what you will about this incarnation of the character, and you certainly have said a lot, but that was Gotham's Joker. But before we go, I have clearly stated my own opinion on which version of the character I personally preferred. 
and I asked all of you to do the same. And Jerome, once again, won by a landslide victory. But then I thought, hey, what do you people know? I mean, you guys are just, you guys are just a bunch of degenerates. And then I thought further, and I thought, hey, what the hell do I know? I'm just some asshole on the internet. So I'm pretty socially distanced from the content myself. And I can understand if some people think that I'm just too far away from this project to give an informed opinion. And that's why I figured what better way to bring a close to this series than by asking some of the people who are a little bit closer to this project on which Joker they preferred. So without further ado, I give you some of the cast of Gotham giving their informed opinions on the Jerome versus Jeremiah debate. Hope you enjoy. Hi V, it's Ben. Thank you for the question. And it's a really interesting one. And, you know, one I honestly kind of struggled with. Because, you know, Jeremiah and Jerome are both played by Cameron Monaghan. And um, I will admit, though, that the, the first time that I saw both of them in the same room together, I, I maybe thought they were different actors, just for a split second, but, you know. <laughs> Which is honestly amazing. And honestly, I, Cameron Monaghan is insane. So, anyways, to get back on topic... Um, I think I'd probably have to say that, um, I'm a little more partial to Jeremiah because like, you know, with Jerome, you know, when you first see him, he kind of, you know, starts off crazy. But with Jeremiah, you kind of see that, like, that process, that arc as he gets more and more insane. And I just think that's really interesting and a super fun watch. And again, you know, to sing Cameron's praises a bit more, he does it <laughs> a ton of justice, so... Honestly, um, yeah, I'd probably have to go with Jeremiah. What's up, V? How you doing? V Infuso, what a cool name you've got. You sound like a Bond villain or something. Uh, it's your old buddy Drew, a.k.a. Butch, a.k.a. Grundy, a.k.a. other things, but I know you're a Gotham guy, so that's all you care about. Um, how you doing? Sending you a bunch of love and health and happiness your way. Hope you and yours are staying healthy in this crazy pandemic we're living through um appreciate you reaching out and i know you asked me a question who do i like better as joker in gotham jerome or jeremiah and it's a tough question because i think cameron did a great job on both and i think they wrote them both incredibly well but i'm old school guy butch is always old school so i'm gonna go with jerome so that's my final answer although it's pretty close anyway um all my best to you and your family and thanks for watching uh i love so much that people can still watch on netflix and that it's still out there in the world and making people happy so be well v take good care till the next time bye bye what's up v infuso it's david mazuz we're from gotham i think some memorabilia around my room should prove that in case you didn't believe me that we have this awesome um painting i guess that's painting, drawing, you can call it what you want. Boom, little Batman there. This, that lamp, is fun fact from Wayne Manor. That's also from Wayne Manor. These jellyfish, these weird jellyfish things are from Wayne Manor. Ignored the weird lint roller that was also on my nightstand. Um, and of course, of course, we have a collection of Batman. So, now that I've successfully proved to you that I am Bruce Wayne, um, I'd like to give my authoritative opinion on the question of Jerome versus Jeremiah, a classic question, if I do say so myself. Um, so, uh, listen, to be completely honest, V, um, I'm in the Jeremiah, I mean, I mean, I'm sorry, I misspoke. I'm in the Jerome camp. I am fully in the Jerome camp. I, you might have been expecting some kind of politically pleasing answer where I say, you know, they both have things that are great and, and they both, you know, have qualities that each will you know, show, make themselves apparent in the fully realized version of the Joker. But to be completely honest, while that is true, I just prefer the Jerome version of the Joker. And what's cool, now looking back on the Jerome Jeremiah kind of um, thing that we did on Gotham, uh, is with, with the new information, uh, with the new information now that we have from the Batman universe that from the Batman canon that there are th actually three jokers um, It's pretty cool to see that uh, To see that there have been multiple 
Joker prototypes in the past as well. Um, I don't know how into the comics you are, but there are three Jokers now. There's not just one Joker, but there's three Jokers, all pretending to be the same one guy. And, um, you know, very similar concept to the Jerome Jeremiah thing. And so it's cool to track back um, how instead of looking at the Jerome and Jeremiah kind of characteristics and qualities as all contributing to one eventual incarnation of the Joker, but all actually being one all one incarnation of the Joker that's that everyone thinks is one incarnation of the Joker, but is really in reality three separate Jokers. Just something to think about. Anyway, hope that answers your question. That's where I stand. Have a great day. I want to say thank you so much to Ben, Drew, and David for answering my questions honestly in those cameos, and I highly recommend checking them all out and ordering a cameo from them yourselves on Cameo.com. Erin Richards, who stars as Barbara Keene in Gotham, has addressed the possibility of her character eventually becoming Harley Quinn in the Batman prequel series. <laughs> you didn't really answer my question. Now, as promised in my previous Gotham Joker vids, I'm here to discuss Gotham's Harley Quinn. And more so, if Gotham actually really had one. Now, I know what you're thinking. V, uh, of course they did. Echo was their pseudo Harley. She looked the part, she acted the part, she had the same accent, had a similar-ish backstory. But I don't think it's all that cut and dry. As previously established, when Gotham was being made, the showrunners had the rights to certain characters, but they were also explicitly told not to use others. In turn, they basically laughed in Warner Brothers' face and did whatever the hell they wanted to do anyway. So while they never actually technically, technically used characters such as Joker and Harley, they instead used what can best be described as tribute characters. Characters who would serve the same purpose to the series and were essentially, for all intents and purposes, the characters they were told that they were not allowed to use just sans name. The most obvious of these types of characters were Jerome and Jeremiah Valeska, two brothers both portrayed by Cameron Monaghan, who were obviously meant to be Gotham's interpretation of the Joker. But less obvious is the curious case of Barbara Keene, the wife of Jim Gordon and the one day mother of the first Batgirl, Barbara Gordon. And up until the show Gotham, those were pretty much the only things that she was notable for. If there was anything Gotham did right, and actually, come to think of it, there were a lot of things, but if there was one thing that I can single out, ONE THING! It was establishing or building on characters that either didn't get their due elsewhere, or were simply background components to the story. Whether you loved or hated the characterization of Barbara Keene in the show, the show did at least manage to make her a character instead of just the mother or wife of one, which is pretty much what she was in the comic books, and also everything else. I mean, really, and really think about this, what can you tell me about that character based on her time in the Dark Knight trilogy? As a matter of fact, I bet most of you are scratching your heads right now thinking, wait, she was in those movies? Yeah, kinda. A little. Sort of. Now, granted, sometimes the character in the show came off as inconsistent or maybe just lacking a clear direction, but ultimately, she did have at least her own personality and character traits. So now let's go over what we know about Gotham's Barbara Keene. Barbara was shown to be bisexual as she was engaged in romantic and otherwise relationships with both men and women, having been linked both to Jim Gordon and Renee Montoya, amongst other names. She was a crazed, mentally unstable, violent, overly jealous psychopath who knew how to use a mallet. And while being a real-life Looney Tune who knew her way around a weapons arsenal, who would also gladly just straight up throw hands, she was also a fairly intelligent and a vulnerable human being. Despite her twisted demeanor, she was depicted as having a surprisingly caring nature to her. She was a redeemable character as she sought redemption for her past ways in later seasons. And her madness was brought on by past trauma at the hands of a manipulative maniac. She'd occasionally don a black and red color scheme, and for a time being even had a working relationship with a smiling psycho. So now I'll ask, is any of this ringing any bells to anybody? Coincidence? I think not! I guess the real question here is, is Barbara Keene a Harley Quinn prototype in the realm of Gotham? And here today to help me answer that question is this cartoon dog. Hello there, noble degenerates. My name is Channel Pop. I run a channel dedicated to talking about comic book entertainment, pop culture, gaming, and more. But I'm not out to critique everything. I'm here to speak with my heart. And one thing that remains very close to my heart over a year after its ending is the Gotham TV series. So the question of the day is, does Barbara Keen count as an early Harley Quinn in the Gotham TV series? And I would say, 
Absolutely. I don't know how intentional it is, but Barbara Keane definitely comes across as a different means to the same end scenario, like they do with a number of their more tribute-based characters. You see, Gotham have their clean-cut characters, like Jim Gordon, Bruce Wayne, like there's, there's no argument as to who those guys are. But then there are their tribute characters like Barbara Keane or Jerome Valeska, where the writers maybe wanted to tell a story about a character that wouldn't fit in Gotham's timeline, so they made a brand new character to kind of tell that story, but in a very reworked, reinterpreted way. And I would absolutely say that Barbara Keane is without a doubt a reinterpretation of Harley Quinn. Because while the details are different, the story is pretty much identical. She's a feisty young woman that we're supposed to care about because Jim Gordon clearly cares about her, who enters a very toxic and abusive relationship with a manipulative mastermind. Except this time this manipulative mastermind isn't the Joker, but instead the Ogre. Now, now the ogre had every intention of killing Barbara, but instead decided to manipulate her into a love interest for him that he could manipulate and control. Sound kind of familiar, right? He preyed upon her every instability and transformed her into a killer. Not just any killer, but the killer of her own parents. In many ways, this is very much the Joker and Harley Quinn origin story, just with different names and different locations and different circumstance, but the story beats are overall the same and the development developments are overall the same. And thus Barbara Keane would also go insane and embrace this new version of herself, much like Harley Quinn did. And to really drive this home, they did team her up with Jerome Valeska, who was the show's tribute to the Joker. And it really helps that for the brief amount of time they shared together on screen, Erin Richards and Cameron Monaghan had great chemistry. In this case though, she wasn't Jerome or the Joker's henchwoman, she was a henchwoman for Theo Gallivan. At the same time, so was Jerome Valeska. Not to mention there was no kind of romantic interest between Jerome Valeska and Barbara Keane. But I think it was very intentional that they did put these two side by side for the end of Jerome's Gotham Season 2 trilogy. As she kind of grows more stable within her life as a criminal and more independent, Tabitha Gallivan becomes Barbara's new love interest. So you've got that whole thing of going from the abusive male relationship over to the homosexual female relationship. And this is where she sort of starts to embrace kind of more of an anti-hero-like identity, which is much more similar to the Harley Quinn of the New 50 era of DC Comics. You've had that progression from doting girlfriend, through to victim, through to henchwoman, and now she's kind of much more independent. She's very much more found her match with Tabitha Gallivan. She's no longer playing second fiddle to anyone, she's the boss now, she is the head bitch in charge. If, if you've seen the Harley Quinn TV series, you'll know what I'm getting at there. And then in Gotham Season 4, she forms the Gotham City Sirens, very much taking Harley Quinn's place in that team for the Gotham TV series version. In the new 52 comics run as well, Harley Quinn has had run-ins with other villains and other characters and unlikely team-ups, and they kind of do this with the whole Demon's Head storyline. Something I'm a little bit critical of, but it does feel like the kind of thing you could imagine Harley Quinn getting herself into. The key difference being that Barbara Keane doesn't quite have that ditzy comedic facade that Harley Quinn does. She also, I mean, this is a reach, but she also wears a lot of red and black. And I do think Erin Richards does prove that she could be a good fit for a Harley Quinn character. Now, the point where she starts to move out of that Harley Quinn mold and become very much more her own character is definitely towards the end of season four, for better or for worse. Now, coincidentally at this time, they also started carving out a brand new Joker character. So Barbara Keane, as a surviving part of that former Joker Harley dynamic we had from season one through to three, is now forming as something different to make way for a new Joker dynamic, which would also give way to a new Harley Quinn-esque character. I can't say for definite as to whether or not this was in intentional. There is still a small chance that this could be coincidence, but I definitely do think there are at least a few deliberate echoes of a Harley Quinn character in Barbara Keane. And I do think this was a very smart way of handling a Harley Quinn-esque storyline without doing Harley Quinn. Their stories follow the same beats, the same structure. It's just very much reworked, and that is very much what Gotham does. I think in many ways, Barbara Keane is to Harley Quinn what Jerome Valeska was to the Joker, where she was kind of a dead ringer, but there were a few clues in there before they pulled the rug under our feet and said, ah, 
gotcha. It can't be her. And I think this is something that isn't commonly talked about when it comes to Gotham. I think people tend to just approach Barbara Keane as a brand new character, which sometimes reminded us of Harley, especially in the early part of season two. But I do think there is much more to it than that, which is why I really appreciate you, V Infuso, for bringing me on to talk about this. You proposed a very thought-provoking idea for this video, and it's been a blast actually thinking this through and realizing that there were more similarities than I'd initially thought just through, well, thinking about it some more. I'm gonna hand it back over to you now, but thanks again for having me on your show. Take it easy, buddy, and take it easy, fellow Vgenerates. Pup, thank you for the kind words. You are truly my favorite talking canine. Eddie McDowd could bite it. Yeah, I don't really know how many people are going to get that reference, but, but there it is. But back to the matter at hand, I too was unaware if the Harley Quinn comparison was entirely coincidental. And for a while, I even believed I was alone in thinking that she resembled the clown princess of crime. Until I discovered via YouTube comments and Reddit posts that others have also made the same correlation as well. I've also discovered that allegedly the producers of the show also toyed around with the idea of making her the series Harley, or alternatively the series Magpie. The latter of which I think would have been awesome and I would have been genuinely interested in seeing. However, ultimately nothing came of it. And instead we got a different Magpie in the show's final season. In an interview with CinemaBlend, Richard said that there have been conversations about her character becoming Harley Quinn. I told ya! Truth be told, I'm kind of relieved that Barbara didn't wind up being the show's answer to Harley Quinn. I enjoyed her far too much as her own thing. To a degree. Around the time she teamed up with Ra's al Ghul, as, that's where things felt a little too contrived and out of place for me. I was like, I, I don't know if this is... This, this just doesn't feel natural. This doesn't feel uh, like anything at all, actually, come to think of it. It's just, it just, it just not... No. No. I enjoy the Barbara Keen character, and I'm thankful that the show gave her some kind of characterization. They could have very easily made her the non-character that she is in practically everything else. But instead, they at least wrote her to be something. Or, or more importantly, someone. Maybe I'll go further in depth on Bab Sr. in the future, but I'll end it here for now. Because this video isn't about Barbara Keen, it's about Harley Quinn. Do I think that she was a precursor to Harley Quinn? Absolutely. I would even say in the finale, they kind of hinted at that with that one cheeky line. But there was another you, I, I seem to recall. Wasn't there? Then again, there was another me too. Proof! I mean, come on, the writing is on the pad itself here. I give it to you, you got me there. Right. I want to thank Channel Pup for coming to the channel. I've been a big fan of his work for a little bit now. As a matter of fact, I only made my own Gotham Joker series where I explored the history of the character and my thoughts on it after watching his Gotham Joker series. Now, if you guys haven't already, I'm going to need you to head on over to Channel Pup's channel. Channel Pup. And press that big red subscribe button. And don't forget to let him know who sent you. And if you enjoyed this crossover, well then you're in luck because Pup will be returning to this channel next month as we go into part two in this two-part series. With that being said, I want to thank you all Vgenerates for watching once again, and I hope to catch you in the next one. <laughs> oh, give it a rest. Now, previously on this channel, I spoke about the show Gotham. A, a couple of times. A, a lot. Okay, a lot. I, I do that a lot here. I'm sorry. So me. And in my last Gotham video, we discussed the potential Harley Quinn that was Barbara Keene. A character who shared a fair amount of traits and mannerisms to the girl in question. And also a character that the series creators even toyed around with revealing as the Maid of Mischief. However, there was a much more obvious nod to Harley Quinn in the character of Echo. Now, when we were first introduced to this character, she was the polar opposite of her source counterpart. Not only was she seemingly mentally well, but she was also almost a bland, emotionless stoic who had little to no reaction to anything, including death threats. She's confident and maybe even a little bit smug, outright laughing off the danger that's Jerome and casually escorting detectives to Jeremiah upon request. In any and all given situations, Echo was pretty much able to keep her cool. She served as the aide and the proxy to Jeremiah, who was socially distancing himself from society in fear of his psychotic twin brother. Echo would meet with people and speak on Jeremiah's behalf as he remained hidden. She devoted her entire life to being the voice of the voiceless Valeska, her sole motivation being 
whatever Jeremiah's sole motivation was. Case in point, she supported his goal to rebuild Gotham City, but then immediately was in favor of his goal to try and destroy it. Whether he be face or heel, Echo was Jeremiah's constant right-hand man. Woman. You get the point. And this was all with little to no prompting, so it seemed like she really didn't have a grounded moral compass of her own. She just wanted to see Jeremiah get his way, whatever way that may be. Yo, shout out to Echo, she's the real ride or die right there. Sounds like someone else we know. Not gonna point any elbows, but uh... Just saying. She'd only become more twisted with time, as an off-screen bullet to the head seemed to rattle her brain. In the ultimate attempt of proving her undying loyalty to Jeremiah, she either allowed him to shoot her, or she shot herself in his name. Now since this is a comic book show, you're gonna have to try to roll with the logic here, uh, and it may be lacking sometime, but it's, it's a little thing called uh, suspension of disbelief. But somehow, a bullet caused a complete personality shift. The normally calm and collected Echo suddenly became comical and crazy. Now, if this personality change wasn't enough to convince you that this was Gotham's take on Harley, uh, well then, hearing her speak should do the job. What's the matter? Don't you want to meet Jeremiah? And hey, if you're still doubting me, if you're still sitting here, wagging your finger saying, V, I, I don't know, I, 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 I think you're stretching this one. Then let me remind you that around this time, she also began wearing a red and black jester costume with a diamond design. I, I mean, come on. Ne need I say more? I will, but I, I shouldn't have to. I shouldn't have to is my point. And that's not even mentioning that she started referring to people as Puddin. Oh, Puddin. Aren't you delicious? I mean, come on, I'm not imagining this. Clearly, I'm not crazy. And here to tell you just how functionally sane I am is this talking cartoon dog. Hello, noble regenerates, and happy holidays from all of us at Channel Pub. So the discussion when it comes to Echo is very different to the discussion when it comes to Barbara Keene regarding how they were integrated as Gotham's versions of Harley Quinn. With Barbara Keene there's a lot of theorizing you can do and it's open to a lot of interpretation but with Echo it's pretty clean cut. Gotham had just carved out a brand new Joker with Jeremiah Valeska to replace Jerome and with him came a brand new Harley Quinn character, just as Barbara Keen started evolving away from the Harley Quinn archetype. Now admittedly, we didn't get as much time with Echo as I think I would have liked, but that doesn't mean she didn't leave a distinct impression. As Echo was very much reminiscent of the Paul Dini Bruce Tim era of Harley Quinn. Which is great because Harley Quinn is a character that has changed so much over the years since her creation and origins in Batman the Animated Series and it was nice to kind of get a return to that form. I sometimes worry that with the changes done to the character, we sometimes lose touch with what Harley Quinn was originally all about. Harley Quinn has gone from kind of an allegory for domestic abuse through to endless horny posting, through to being more of an anti-hero akin to Deadpool. As she and her story have developed away from the Joker over the years into her forming her own character, or as most people would have you believe, but personally I think she was already her own character. Just a character that suffered at the hands of the greatest villain in fictional history, or at least one of them anyway. Because I just can't in all good faith discredit my boy Mysterio like that. With Bar Barbara Keane, we kind of got little doses of every little bit of Harley Quinn's progression and story, whereas Echo very much committed to that kind of mad love story, where she's in a very toxic relationship with the Joker. But of course, she doesn't follow the exact same story beats as what Harley Quinn did. For starters, her name is not Harleen Quinzel, and she's not a doctor at Arkham Asylum, instead being Jeremiah Valeska's trusty proxy. While she definitely works for Jeremiah, or at that stage his pseudonym, Xander Wilde, she definitely seems to have herself all together, much like Jeremiah did at that time. Well, of course, not without the occasional slip-up. Much like Jeremiah, once he went over the edge, so did she. But for a while, in like the later half of season four, they were both pretty subtle takes on the Joker and Harley Quinn, before really evolving more into classic Joker and classic Harley, going a bit more zany in season five. 
Hmm, I can kind of see why she's called Echo at this point. But from here on out, this is kind of just going to be an Echo appreciation post on my end of things. Because truth be told, I don't really have that much to say this time. Probably the exact thing you shouldn't say during a collab with one of your favorite YouTubers, but hey, get out of my face. The reason why Echo was such a breath of fresh air is you gotta consider where Harley Quinn was at at this time. She was basically being used for cameo and team-up comics as a zany kind of Deadpool-esque character in the comics at this time. And standing opposite Echo as the other live-action Harley Quinn, we had Margot Robbie's Harley Quinn. Now, no offense to Margot Robbie, but the theatrical cut of Suicide Squad is the worst fucking piece of shit I've ever seen in my entire life. Part of the reason why? Harley Quinn. They tried to tell a Paul Dini era story with their Harley Quinn, but what they actually ended up drawing most of their inspiration from was the horny posting era of Harley Quinn. But full disclosure, I'm not just bitching because she wasn't like my idea of Harley Quinn. That was just a fucking prolapse of a movie. But like all of the subtle nuance that this story could possibly have and that this character could possibly have was gone, evaporated, boom, goodbye. So then we have Echo, who's quite a bit more subtle. She's not ridiculously over-sexualized, she's not always having smoochy smoochy with Mr. J. She's not constantly spouting one-liners about how she's a bad guy, it's what she does. She acted like an actual character in a piece of media made by professionals. Huh. Funny how that can bring better results. For starters, the tragic origins of Harley Quinn. Well, one of the things that doesn't sit right with me about the New 52 interpretation and Suicide Squad was that a lot of her origins pivots on her getting thrown into a vat of acid. What I really like about Harley Quinn's origins is kind of the subtlety of the Joker just gently unraveling another human being in front of her very eyes, simply with his words and attitude. With Echo, we don't quite have that, but it's a little better, I guess. She's, it's kind of implied that she's been kind of lobotomized with a bullet in, like, the back of her skull. And I gotta tell you, that's pretty dark. That's, that's quite a bit darker than the Vat of Acid, so I, I do prefer that. And as well as that, I mean, Echo isn't called Harley Quinn. I feel like there's a bit more leeway with this as part of what I think makes Gotham really work is that it's brand new interpretations. And I mean, subtle has never really been Gotham's thing, but it still managed to do it more tastefully than that other interpretation. I understand I should be more, you know, praising Echo based on her own merits as opposed to just how bad the other versions of Harley Quinn were at this time. And admittedly, the Margot Robbie Harley Quinn did improve quite a bit in Birds of Prey. Not a massive fan of that movie, but she did improve. But the thing is, I don't have that much to work with here, as Echo is only in, like, what, four episodes? And only in one of them does she really get any kind of substantial amount of screen time. But here's what I will say. I think the abusive relationship between the Joker and Harley Quinn is very well represented through Jeremiah and Echo. He's lobotomized her, but he doesn't just be smoochy smoochy with her after that. He's still very pushy and impolite towards her, and pretty unpredictable. You can see how he really orders her around, and views her as kind of more of a henchwoman than so much a girlfriend. Another thing that I really must praise is at this time, Echo had by far the best live action Harley Quinn costume. I do think the one in the upcoming Suicide Squad movie from James Gunn does top it, but this at that time was the closest thing we had to classic Harley. And I really love how that jester suit has been reinterpreted here. I'm guessing that because of the embargo on the Joker and Harley Quinn and Batman, they probably weren't allowed to give her Harley's iconic pigtails, but I think they made it work with the, um... I don't know the name of that hairstyle, but I think they made it work. It's one of those things where they haven't been allowed to use certain aspects of the character's design, but they've made a design that works on its own merits and remains just as iconic, just like what they did with Jerome Valeska. No, he didn't have the white face paint and shit, but like he had a cut off face, it's really creepy looking. It still looks iconic. Now, what I also appreciate here is that Echo wasn't it. Echo was not the last implied Harley Quinn in the Gotham series. As in the finale, after a little scrap with Barbara, heh, <laughs> worlds collide, am I right? Echo gets injured, and then our royalty-free joke man, well, he disposes of her. She's damaged goods at this point, what's she worth? 
Either that or Joke Man just wasn't going to pay for her medical bills. But she doesn't seem to take the euthanasia too personally. And then Jeremiah says there are more fish in the sea, hinting at a future Harley Quinn, which actually kind of coincides well with a brief panel from the New 52, where the Joker implies the existence of previous Harleys. An idea that was never properly explored for some reason until here, rendering Gotham's Harley Quinn merely just an echo of things to come. See what I did there? You like that? Okay, subscribe to my channel, please. Okay, but in all seriousness, thanks again, V, for having me on your show, buddy. I hope you enjoyed working together just as much as I did. Until the next time, Vgenerates. Thanks, pup. Much appreciated. And I just knew that if there was any way to prove that I'm not crazy, it was through means of a talking cartoon dog. So you came in handy for that one. By the way, if you guys haven't already, I really highly recommend checking out Channel Pup. Guy's got a great channel, he's a lot more articulate than me, and he has a lot more hair on his head, and I'm not jealous at all about that, it's fine. Douchebag. But in all seriousness, he makes really great content, and if you guys are a fan of me, then you'll definitely be a fan of him, because he does what I do, but a lot better. And somehow he has not as many subs, and that is a crime. So I'm going to need all you contributing degenerates to head on over to his channel and let him know who sent you. But not before finishing this video, because I still got some things I want to say. Something that should also be noted is that Echo's actress, Francesca Root Dotson, I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name, I kind of have a habit of doing that. But Echo's actress was originally brought in for a one-off appearance. And she only continued to appear on the show because the producers liked her performance so much. She also actually had to re-audition for the show after the decision was made to make the character more psychotic. Because the showrunners weren't sure that this complete character shift was in her range. And luckily, as you can see by the end result, it very much was. Also, according to Francesca... She herself watched clips from the animated series and Suicide Squad in an effort to familiarize herself with the character. You know, the character who is allegedly not Harley Quinn? Yeah, that makes sense. Ah, oh, it checks out to me. No, no, it works, it works. So now the question comes down to, do I believe that Echo was Gotham's Harley Quinn? Well, despite what everything else in this video would probably tell you, her accent, her appearance, her outfit choices, and just overall mannerisms, what, 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 despite what all of that would dictate. No. No, I do not. As a matter of fact, I think I actually called Reyes, or maybe it was Alan out on an episode of Dumb Fucks, when he listed Echo as one of his favorite Harley Quinns. If I did that, I'm going to roll the footage. If I didn't, I'm just going to look stupid. Uh, more than I already do. But I'm going with Echo from Gotham. Okay, I'll, I'll allow it. Echo was the show's means to an end. She was Harley Quinn without the show having Harley Quinn. But ultimately, she was nothing more than a precursor to the Harley Quinn character. Of course, there's the obvious fact that she's not named Harleen Quinzel, but the fact that she so quickly killed off at the last minute, with the show's Joker specifically stating that there will be others. There'll never be one like you. Really? But I suppose there are other fish in the sea. It seems like an intentional indication that she wasn't this universe's Harley. And it even comes off as a hint that within this lore, there would actually be Harley. At some point in the distant future that we will never get to see. So, good. Th thanks for that. I'm looking forward to... Not seeing that. Thanks. For the record, I think Francesca did an amazing job in the role. And she managed to bring the character to life without ever actually being declared the character. She was an absolute highlight of the last season of Gotham. Even if she didn't get the screen time, a lot of fans would have hoped that she got. In case you're wondering, I am those fans. I'm not a huge fan of the Jeremiah Joker arc. I definitely feel like it was a downgrade from the original Jerome Joker story. But the Echo character was absolutely the silver lining to this plot. Call me Penguin. Failure is not an option. I am powerful. I am vicious! I am not a man to be trifled with. <laughs> hey there, it's me, your least favorite YouTuber, V Infuso. Mediocre content creator and giant Batman nerd. And today I'm here to talk to you about Gotham. Again. And joining me is everyone's favorite animated talking dog, Channel Pup. Also, 
Again. Hello again, V-generates. So for those who don't recognize me, hello again, V-gins. Yep, that's right, I said what I said. I make content about different DC and Marvel properties. Yes, that's right, I'm a fan of both, we exist. And I got my start on this platform talking about Gotham. So it's always a pleasure to be revisiting this subject with my good pal V Infuso. Now there are a lot of notable villains in Batman's rogues gallery. Too many, in fact. There are so many established names that even A-list foes have to take a backseat to other big bads. And I think that's the case with the Penguin. I mean, yeah, sure, he's well known. Even if you're not an avid Batman fan, like myself, I'm sure that you have a general knowledge and understanding on who this guy is. Or at the very least, you know his name. I'm pretty sure that, that most people can identify which Batman villain this is without having ever seen anything Batman. He's out there in pop culture. People know Oswald Cobblepot. Maybe not as Oswald Cobblepot, but they know the face nonetheless. And yet, this character is rarely ever explored. He's typically overlooked in favor of the Joker, the Riddler, or Two-Face. Which is a real shame, because the Penguin is actually a genuinely interesting character. The guy has a similar background and upbringing to Batman. Though it's pretty clear that they went different routes later in life. In some ways, he's almost like Bruce Wayne's polar opposite. The guy's like the anti-Bruce. You could probably imagine that interesting stories can be crafted from that alone. Not to mention, the guy is a mob boss with a seemingly endless amount of connections. No matter what it is he needs, he's got a guy for that. He may not like to get his flippers dirty, but he has all the power to get things done and keep his conscience clean. So yeah, the Penguin most definitely poses a threat to anybody who crosses his path. And yet, this is a character that largely goes uncelebrated. When Gotham first came out, a lot of emphasis in the marketing was on the Penguin. It seemed like he was made to be the star of the show, the real threat to an already hopeless city. I remember being kind of excited to see what this new show Gotham would do with the character. And then when it came out, well, it certainly surprised me. But it didn't disappoint. So, Penguin is easily the most prevalent villain in Gotham. I think it could be debated that he is the main villain of the show. And I remember when the first set photos and promo images were coming out of Robin Lord Taylor as the Penguin, and I was like, wait a minute, he's not a fat dwarf. What, what the hell? This doesn't make any sense. I didn't really have any prior affinity towards the Penguin, to be honest, before this came out, so I wasn't all that excited for Robin Lord Taylor's performance. Nothing personal, I just didn't care much for the Penguin. I think my favourite version before this came out was the version in Arkham City, because he's a straight-up fucking monster, effectively. But not in the literal sense, like in Batman Returns. But anyway, I get away from myself. The story of Oswald Cobblepot in Gotham is the ultimate evil spin on Rags to Riches. From the Umbrella Boy and Servant to Fish Mooney, through to being crowned King of Gotham. And what makes Penguin so interesting is his methodology. In the first season, we explore the Penguin's total lack of principle. This guy will act in his self-interest and only his self-interest. He doesn't care who he lies to, who he has to manipulate. Gotham is a dog-eat-dog -dog world as far as he's concerned. And he goes out of his way to manipulate some of Gotham's most dangerous crime bosses, such as Sal Maroney and Don Falcone. His determination to rise to the very top of Gotham's food chain is so present in this arc that I just couldn't help but get invested. But Penguin isn't the Gary Stew of Gotham's underworld either. It's very much an uphill battle of survival for Oswald Cobblepot, because this guy gets himself almost killed every other day. I just want to say this right now. The scene where Penguin and Sal Maroney play the truth game, or the secrets game, is fucking iconic. That shit is incredible cinema, and I'm saying this about a medium budget TV show. Hats off, stellar performances, great scene, great setup, holy shit, oh my god, amazing, I cream myself. Gotham was a show set before Batman donned the cape and cowl, when villainy was just on the rise, in a place where crime was already prevalent. And being such, we typically see a lot of our heroes and villains in their origin stories. This is the year one for many a bad. Now, what was especially interesting here to me is that while characters such as the Riddler, Catwoman, Two-Face, and even the Joker had had multiple backstories the writers could adapt, the Penguin, for the most part, did not. 
Very little was known about Oswald Cobblepot before he rose to power in the criminal underworld. His backstory before this show pretty much went, uh, he was rich, and then he wasn't. And then he wasn't. And that's about it. There was so much about the character that was completely unwritten. So even comic book nerds or just fans of Batman and movies and TV had next to no connection with this character. I would imagine that most people who knew of the Penguin probably either knew of Burgess Meredith, who played him back in the 1960s show, and you know what, as fun as that show is to watch, I do put it on from time to time for laughs, they really weren't, um, really weren't breaking any new grounds in terms of uh, character development. It was a different time, and it was a different product. If that's what you're looking for, then that's probably not the show to watch. And I'd imagine that the rest of people probably knew of Danny DeVito's performance in Batman Returns, which, while iconic and something I hold close to my heart personally, that was most decidedly not Penguin. That was... That was a completely different character just with the name The Penguin. A lot of people who haven't dove in deep to the Batman product have lived their lives thinking that Penguin is some... a uh, Penguin Man. And that couldn't be further from the truth, because the Penguin is not some Penguin Man. He's more like a... like, like, like a... Like, like a man Penguin. Which is, which is, which is different. So while he was given a backstory and I guess an origin of sorts in Batman Returns, it was decidedly not the background or origin of the actual character. It was a completely different thing. To my knowledge, he didn't actually live in the sewers or use circus performers and live penguins as hired goons. That was, that was typically not written into the, the Batman mythos. Now, in almost all Batman continuities, wherever it starts, the Penguin is already in a seat of power. We see a short, stocky, monocled man with a limp, watching as all those around him get his work done, while he's in the back giving out orders. But here we're shown that that seat wasn't exactly being reserved for him. Throughout this series, we watch as the Penguin climbs his way through Gotham's criminal underworld, where he'd start off as an underling. The series gave us his rise to power, his constant heartbreaks and struggles, the thickening of his skin, and in doing that and showing the complexity as well as the tragic backstory of the character, it almost, in a weird way, makes you root for him. Despite all his villainy, on some level you kinda wanna see the guy succeed. The show does a great job of showcasing his high intellect, incredible foresight, and strategic planning throughout his run. Gotham's Penguin may not hold a physical threat to many, but he should absolutely be seen as a threat to all. Gotham's Penguin was truly unpredictable, and you never know if he's actually being taken advantage of, or if everything is just going according to plan for him. You never know until the final reveal which plans Oswald truly has no control over. And despite the fact that the guy's called the Penguin, he's the definition of a wolf in sheep's clothing. Moving over to Season 2, however, we explore whether or not the Penguin can be redeemed. As the King of Gotham is toppled from his post and dragged to Arkham Asylum, where Hugo Strange allegedly cures him and makes him into a much more gentle character. And after his treatment, Penguin sets out back into Gotham to find his family, where he meets Elijah Cobblepot, and his step-siblings. And yeah, his, his new step-family after Elijah dies are absolute assholes. So ultimately they deserve what came to them, which was Penguin Unleashed once again, as he feeds his stepmother her own children. Man, oh man, that gives new meaning to what are you doing, stepson? Oh. <laughs> well, anyway. The show did a good job of establishing Penguin's humanity, giving him a connection to various other characters. His mother, his father, Martine, Butch, the Riddler. And just when you believe that he's found a light in the darkness that is his very soul, it's yanked away from him, plunging him deeper into that darkness and bringing him closer to his inevitable infamy. All things considered, you might be wondering whether or not the Penguin is actually capable of love. Which is where Season 3 kind of explores Penguin's kind of new romantic interest. He wants to diddle with the Riddle Man. He wants to ligma with Nigma. He wants to stick his beak in the Riddler's crap. And obviously the partnership turns sour. 
Because Riddler knows that ultimately Penguin will always act within his own self-interest. The Penguin is incapable of love. But it's interesting how the Penguin kind of tries to convince himself of his own humanity. He will lie to absolutely anyone and everyone, but that also includes himself when he takes on a young ward in Martine. Trying to convince himself that he's doing a selfless act by looking after Martine, but he too knows deep down he's only acting within his self-interest. And by the time we reach Gotham Season 5, he's kind of accepted this hoarding all of the food that he can, while the rest of Gotham suffers. Another highlight of the Penguin is his dynamic with Butch Gilzine. Penguin's right-hand man who falls in love with Tabitha Galavan, the lady who killed Penguin's mother, and it seems like this was something that was maybe forgotten throughout season 3 and 4, as the uneasy alliance between Penguin and Tabitha, it kind of just dissipates a little bit. Penguin seems pretty over it, until the end of season 4, where we think Penguin's done a really good thing for them in breaking Butch out of his Solomon Grundy state, but really he just wanted to take the opportunity to catch Tabitha off guard and fucking murder Butch. The great thing about Penguin is how he strikes when you sometimes least expect it. He can fool even the audience into thinking that he's being sincere four seasons in because you think his character has developed, but in a very satisfying way, he's still old Oswald Cobblepot. And it's incredible how the writers managed to achieve this without undercutting that development. This is who Penguin is. He's a shit. And Robin Lord Taylor plays this role flawlessly. I didn't know what to expect going in. At first, I kind of thought, well, he's, he's not a dwarf, and he's not fat. But to be fair, they forged a brand new iconic look for this character. They haven't just made it realistic or any stuff like that. They've legitimately made a design with its own sense of iconography. His spiky tufty black hair, which kind of resembles like penguin fur in a way. The penguin's hooked nose is still present. Because he was shot in the leg, he now walks like a penguin. And I'm just saying, I'm pretty envious of his wardrobe. Like, some of those suits are just... They're incredible. Like, I swear, you don't see fashion sense like this in other shows. Of course, Cameron Monaghan's two Jokers stole the show, and became a focal point in the series, completely derailing original plans of having the Penguin as the series' big bad. And despite being a little bit overshadowed, I still think of the Penguin first when I think of Gotham. Probably before I think of any other character. I truly think that Gotham gave us the best Penguin. The show took elements of the classic Penguin character, and from that, they built their own. Not just character, but person. I think a lot of the time, it's understated just how good the show was. For the last couple years, studios have used the trope of turning their bad guys into misunderstood good guys by giving them some dark, tragic backstory. Think you could date that all the way back to Rob Zombie who wanted us all to cheer on Michael Myers. No, it's okay. He had a bad upbringing. It's Just let, let the guy take a stab at him. But I don't think that that's a problem here. I think Gotham did a really good job of finding a fair medium. The show doesn't justify or condone Oswald's actions, but they do make you understand what led up to them. Penguin is a villain through and through. The show at no point confuses him for a hero, but they do establish him as a three-dimensional person. Yeah, he's a bad guy, but sometimes he struggles with being a bad guy. Sometimes he would like to be a good guy. There are times throughout the series where he does try to evolve, he does try to progress as a person. But for one reason or another, it just, it, it just, it just doesn't happen for him. Now, comparing him to other live action takes on the Penguin, obviously we're yet to see Colin Farrell's Penguin in Matt Reeves' The Batman in 2022, but judging by the trailers, he looks like he could be a contender for the most overall comic accurate modern Penguin take. But for now, I would say that this one with Robin Lord Taylor takes the cake. It's a fantastic reinterpretation of the Penguin that is just as iconic as the classic and brings along some of his own iconography. This is now how I see the Penguin and it's gonna be a little bit tricky for me moving into new takes on the Penguin. We've got this one that I would deem definitive. This is, this is the best one yet. This is how I want to see the Penguin from now on. But, you know, obviously I still give Colin Farrell a chance. But this weasley, limey, dirty, scummy, seedy bastard is just a character that it's impossible not to fall in love with. And the way he keeps the audience guessing as to whether or not he could ever be redeemed, as to whether or not he could ever love, and ultimately he's just this guy that acts with his own set of self-interests, 
is just, oh man, what a great character. A superb villain and easily one of the best live action comic book villain adaptations we've ever seen. They doubled down on everything there is to love about the Penguin and then some with this incarnation. It's kind of impossible to compare him to Burgess Meredith because, I mean, Burgess Meredith is the definitive light-hearted and old-school Penguin. And then, of course, there's Danny DeVito, which is like, it's unlike any Penguin ever. It's a completely new character. It's very much a Tim Burtonized, you know, original creation in that regard. Which is fine, but going from Danny DeVito to Robin Lord Taylor is like a breath of fresh air. It's hard to say, as I personally really love Danny DeVito's interpretation of the character. But again, they're so wildly different that it's kind of hard to make a proper comparison. I think if we're talking about which brought the comic book character to life better and more accurately... I'd have to say Robin Lord Taylor. Despite not bearing a stunning similarity to his comic book counterpart, I really do see the Penguin when I look at him. I think he gave one of the best performances of his career, and in doing so gave us one of the best renditions of this character. Honestly, they didn't even need to put him in his classic comic book costume in the season finale, because he earned absolutely all of his own iconography and aesthetic along the way. Yeah, I gotta agree. By time the series finale aired, Fans had already gotten acquainted with and took a liking to this version of the character. I think giving him the monocle and top hat and putting Taylor in a fat suit in the show's last episode was a good intention mistake. At this point in time, he already proved that he was the Penguin. We didn't need to see the guy in what looked like Comic-Con cosplay. This just wasn't this show's Penguin. It kind of feels a little bit out of character, and very, very unnecessary. Thanks for sitting with me for a bit. I hope you'll be willing to check out my own content, maybe. But as it stands, thank you so much, VNFuser, for having me on your show once again. I'm always game to talk about Gotham, what can I say? Take it easy, Vigenerates. If you for some reason haven't already, rectify that problem now and head on over to Channel Pup's channel. Link in the description below. Head on over, press that big red subscribe button, and don't forget to let him know who sent ya. Anyway, with that being said, I was your least favorite YouTuber, V Infuso. That was Channel Pup, and I thank you for watching. Hope to see you in the next one. I am vengeance. I am the knight. And that was V Infuso. Just remember, if you're not tuning in, then you're missing out. So, if you like the words that came out of his mouth hole... And you too would like to become a V-Generate? Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, nerds! And if you're not joining the fun, you're in for one bad day. And you know what they say about having one bad day. <laughs> Catch him next time. Same bad time. Same bad channel.